This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susan Okimoto, Chicago, Illinois. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 21. The Expedition. It was a cheerless morning when they got into the street, blowing and raining hard, and the clouds looking dull and stormy. The night had been very wet. Large pools of water had collected in the road, and the kennels were overflowing. There was a faint glimmering of the coming day in the sky, but it rather aggravated than relieved the gloom of the scene, the somber light only serving to pale that which the street lamps afforded, without shedding any warmer or brighter tints upon the wet house tops and dreary streets. There appeared to be nobody stirring in that quarter of the town. The windows of the houses were all closely shut, and the streets through which they passed were noiseless and empty. By the time they had turned into the Bethnal Green Road, the day had fairly begun to break. Many of the lamps were already extinguished. A few country wagons were slowly toiling on towards London. Now and then, a stagecoach covered with mud rattled briskly by, the driver bestowing as he passed an admonitory lash upon the heavy wagoner, who, by keeping on the wrong side of the road, had endangered his arriving at the office a quarter of a minute after his time. The public houses, with gas lights burning inside, were already open. By degrees, other shops began to be unclosed, and a few scattered people were met with. Then came straggling groups of laborers going to their work, then men and women with fish baskets on their heads, donkey carts laden with vegetables, chase carts filled with livestock or whole carcasses of meat, milk women with pails, an unbroken concourse of people trudging out with various supplies to the eastern suburbs of the town. As they approached the city, the noise and traffic gradually increased. When they threaded the streets between Shoreditch and Smithfield, it had swelled into a roar of sound and bustle. It was as light as it was likely to be, till night came on again, and the busy morning of half the London population had begun. Turning down Sun Street and Crown Street and crossing Finsbury Square, Mr. Sykes struck, by way of Chiswell Street, into Barbican, thence into Long Lane, and so into Smithfield, from which latter place arose a tumult of discordant sounds that filled Oliver Twist with amazement. It was market morning. The ground was covered, nearly ankle-deep, with filth and mire, a thick steam perpetually rising from the reeking bodies of the cattle, and mingling with the fog, which seemed to rest upon the chimney-tops, hung heavily above. All the pens in the center of the large area, and as many temporary pens as could be crowded into the vacant space, were filled with sheep. Tied up to posts by the gutter side were long lines of beasts and oxen, three or four deep. Countrymen, butchers, drovers, hawkers, boys, thieves, idlers, and vagabonds of every low grade were mingled together in a mass. The whistling of drovers, the barking dogs, the bellowing and plunging of the oxen, the bleating of sheep, the grunting and squeaking of pigs, the cries of hawkers, the shouts, oaths, and quarreling on all sides, the ringing of bells and roar of voices that issued from every public house, the crowding, pushing, driving, beating, whooping, and yelling, the hideous and discordant dim that resounded from every corner of the market, and the unwashed, unshaven, squalid, and dirty figures constantly running to and fro, and bursting in and out of the throng, rendered it a stunning and bewildering scene, which quite confounded the senses. Mr. Sykes, dragging Oliver after him, elbowed his way through the thickest of the crowd, and bestowed very little attention on the numerous sights and sounds, which so astonished the boy. He nodded twice or thrice to a passing friend, and, resisting as many invitations to take a morning dram, pressed steadily onward, until they were clear of the turmoil, and had made their way through Hosier Lane into Holborn. "'Now, young'un,' said Sykes, looking up at the clock of St. Andrew's Church, "'hard upon seven. You must step out!' Come, don't lag behind already, lazy legs. Mr. Sykes accompanied this speech with a jerk at his little companion's wrist. Oliver, quickening his pace into a kind of trot between a fast walk and a run, kept up with the rapid strides of the housebreaker as well as he could. They held their course at this rate until they had passed Hyde Park Corner and were on their way to Kensington, when Sykes relaxed his pace until an empty cart which was at some little distance behind came up. Seeing Hounslow written on it, he asked the driver with as much civility as he could assume if he would give them a lift as far as Isleworth. "'Jump up,' said the man. "'Is that your boy?' "'Yes, he's my boy,' replied Sykes, looking hard at Oliver and putting his hand abstractedly into the pocket where the pistol was. "'Your father walks rather too quick for you, don't he, my man?' inquired the driver, seeing that Oliver was out of breath. "'Not a bit of it,' replied Sykes, interposing. "'He's used to it. Here, take hold of my hand, Ned.' 
In with you. Thus addressing Oliver, he helped him into the cart, and the driver, pointing to a heap of sacks, told him to lie down there and rest himself. As they passed the different milestones, Oliver wondered more and more where his companion meant to take him. Kensington, Hammersmith, Chiswick, Kewbridge, Brentford were all past, and yet they went on as steadily as if they had only just begun their journey. At length they came to a public house called the Coach and Horses, a little way beyond which another road appeared to run off, and here the cart stopped. Sykes dismounted with great precipitation, holding Oliver by the hand all the while, and lifting him down directly, bestowed a furious look upon him, and wrapped the side pocket with his fist in a significant manner. "'Good-bye, boy,' said the man. "'He's sulky,' replied Sykes, giving him a shake. "'He's sulky, a young dog. Don't mind him.' "'Not I,' rejoined the other, getting into his cart. "'It's a fine day, after all.' And he drove away. Sykes waited until he had fairly gone, and then telling Oliver he might look about him if he wanted— once again led him onward on his journey. They turned round to the left a short way past the public house, and then, taking a right-hand road, walked on for a long time, passing many large gardens and gentlemen's houses on both sides of the way, and stopping for nothing but a little beer until they reached a town. Here against the wall of a house Oliver saw, written up in pretty large letters, Hampton. They lingered about in the fields for some hours. At length, they came back into the town, and turning into an old public house with a defaced signboard, ordered some dinner by the kitchen fire. The kitchen was an old, low-roofed room with a great beam across the middle of the ceiling, and benches with high backs to them by the fire, on which were seated several rough men in smock frocks, drinking and smoking. They took no notice of Oliver, and very little of Sykes, and, as Sykes took very little notice of them, he and his young comrade sat in a corner by themselves, without being much troubled by their company. They had some cold meat for dinner, and sat so long after it while Mr. Sykes indulged himself with three or four pipes, that Oliver began to feel quite certain they were not going any further. Being much tired with the walk and getting up so early, he dozed a little at first, then, quite overpowered by fatigue and the fumes of the tobacco, fell asleep. It was quite dark when he was awakened by a push from Sykes. Rousing himself sufficiently to sit up and look about him, he found that worthy in close fellowship and communication with a laboring man over a pint of ale. "'So you're going on to Lower Halliford, are you?' inquired Sykes. "'Yes, I am,' replied the man, who seemed a little the worse, or better, as the case might be, for drinking. "'And not slow about it, neither. My horse hasn't got a load behind him going back, as he had coming up in the morning, and he won't be long a-doing of it. Here's luck to him. It God, he's a good um. "'Could you give my boy and me a lift as far as there?' demanded Sykes, pushing the ale towards his new friend. "'If you're going directly, I can,' replied the man, looking out of the pot. "'Are you going to Oliford?' "'Going on to Shepperton,' replied Sykes. "'I'm your man, as far as I go,' replied the other. "'Is all paid, Becky?' "'Yes, the other gentleman's paid,' replied the girl. "'I say,' said the man, with tipsy gravity, "'that won't do, you know.' "'Why not?' rejoined Sykes. "'You are going to accommodate us, and what's to prevent my standing treat for a pint or so in return?' The stranger reflected upon this argument with a very profound face. Having done so, he seized Sykes by the hand and declared he was a real good fellow, to which Mr. Sykes replied he was joking, as, if he had been sober, there would have been strong reason to suppose he was. After the exchange of a few more compliments, they bade the company good night and went out, the girl gathering up the pots and glasses as they did so, and lounging out to the door with her hands full to see the party start. The horse, whose health had been drunk in his absence, was standing outside, ready harnessed to the cart. Oliver and Sykes got in without any further ceremony, and the man to whom he belonged, having lingered for a minute or two to bear him up, and to defy the hostler in the world to produce his equal, mounted also. Then the hostler was told to give the horse his head, and his head being given him, he made a very unpleasant use of it, tossing it into the air with great disdain and running into the parlor windows over the way. After performing those feats and supporting himself for a short time on his hind legs, he started off at great speed and rattled out of the town right gallantly. The night was very dark. A damp mist rose from the river, and the marshy ground about, and spread itself over the dreary fields. It was piercing cold, too. All was gloomy and black. Not a word was spoken, for the driver had grown sleepy, and Sykes was in no mood to lead him into conversation. Oliver sat huddled together in a corner of the cart, bewildered with alarm and apprehension, and figuring strange objects in the gaunt trees, whose branches waved grimly to and fro, as if in some fantastic joy at the desolation of the scene. 
As they passed Sunbury Church, the clock struck seven. There was a light in the ferry house window opposite, which streamed across the road and threw into more somber shadow a dark yew tree with graves beneath it. There was a dull sound of falling water not far off, and the leaves of the old tree stirred gently in the night wind. It seemed like quiet music for the repose of the dead. Sunbury was passed through, and they came again into the lonely road. Two or three miles more, and the cart stopped. Sykes alighted, took Oliver by the hand, and they once again walked on. They turned into no house at Shepperton, as the weary boy had expected, but still kept walking on, in mud and darkness, through gloomy lanes and over cold, open wastes, until they came within sight of the lights of a town at no great distance. On looking intently forward, Oliver saw that the water was just below them, and that they were coming to the foot of a bridge. Sykes kept straight on until they were close upon the bridge, then turned suddenly down a bank upon the left. The water, thought Oliver, turning sick with fear. He has brought me to this lonely place to murder me. He was about to throw himself on the ground and make one struggle for his young life, when he saw that they stood before a solitary house, all ruinous and decayed. There was a window on each side of the dilapidated entrance, and one story above, but no light was visible. The house was dark, dismantled, and by all appearance, uninhabited. Sykes, with Oliver's hand still in his, softly approached the low porch and raised the latch. The door yielded to the pressure, and they passed in together. End of chapter 21